MEPs and other MEPs who are present in the room to make a joint statement and denounce this situation to tell people that it is unacceptable that the European Parliament provides us with a room that is inaccessible. Um, and uh, our friends from the European Disability Forum will uh, help us record this statement. So I suggest that we start now with the event as planned, but uh, cut it a bit shorter. I will try to manage to do my best to cut it shorter where it can be cut shorter. So please take your seats and uh, follow us. the event. Um, I welcome everyone on behalf of our um, consortium. Three organiza organizations joined forces from Hungary, Slovakia and Czechia to raise awareness about accessibility. As it is uh, really demonstrated here in this room with an inaccessible podium, uh, our topic uh, couldn't be more timely. I would like to ask uh, our kind host, uh, Ms. Lucia Juris Nikosonova, to officially open this event. Okay, so this is a very sad symbol of uh, how much we care uh, about people with uh, disabilities and the accessibility of public places. This is a European Parliament in uh, 21st century. It's 2022 of almost 2023, and this is what we offer you for an event, event uh, uh, with the main aim to discuss the accessibility of public places. What a shame. I do apologize, but uh, I think we really have to make a mess. Maybe this is even good. Maybe, maybe with this we can finally move somewhere. Okay. Um, about uh, 18 years ago, I moved uh, from Slovakia to Canada. And I flew to Ottawa, and I remember the journey home from the airport. I was looking out of the car window uh, at the streets of Ottawa, and I saw so many people in wheelchairs and with walking ads that at some point I asked my Canadian husband, is everyone disabled in your country? No, said Tom. But in your country, you are hiding people with disabilities in institutions or you keep them trapped between four walls because they cannot get anywhere. And he was right. In Slovakia, we didn't have barrier-free sidewalks. Our offices had stairs without ramps. Our cinemas and theaters were inaccessible to people in wheelchairs. And it was almost impossible to move around the streets uh, because the cars were parked on the sidewalks. When we came to Canada, our son, son Dominic was four and a half years old and he started to attend an inclusive kindergarten there. For every two healthy children, there was one child with a disability. Together with another boy, Dominic took care of a severely disabled boy, Robert. Most of Robert's body was paralyzed. He moved in electric wheelchair thanks to a special tank control. When the children went out, Dominic and another boy had to prepare Robert. They had to dress him up and cover him with a blanket. When I first saw it, I cried. Because there was nothing like that in Slovakia at that time. And yes, a lot has changed in Slovakia since then. Barrier-free sidewalks are starting to appear in our cities. Ramps for wheelchair users have been added to offices and some construction authorities 
are calling for the evaluation of development projects by people with disabilities or their associations. On the other hand, we still have state institutions with barriers or newly built hotels that pretend to be barrier free because you can actually enter them with a wheelchair, but it is impossible then to use the toilets. If a wheelchair user wants to travel by a train in Slovakia, he must notify the authorities 24 hours in advance, otherwise he or she will not even get on the train. Lately, there had been a lady uh, on a wheelchair elected to the Slovak National Parliament and it actually caused a panic because the parliament was not adopted for an electric wheelchair. And we can see the very same picture and again and again, even in European Parliament. And this is why it is very important for member states, for countries like Slovakia and its people, that the issue of barrier-free accessibility is addressed by binding legislation for member states at the EU level. There are huge differences between the member states in the area of accessibility. And I am convinced that when it comes to accessibility, a wheelchair user in Slovakia should have the same accessibility approach as a wheelchair user, for instance, in Finland or other member states. And this is why we meet here today. Accessibility is a human rights issue. It is laid down in the CRPD and it is also a part of other human rights law. What we are going to talk about is to do with everyone's basic human rights, including when people have special needs due to physical or sensory impairments. Accessibility is regulated both by the EU and the Member States. Our event will discuss how these different levels can work together for a more accessible environment. The EU has a certain responsibility when member states spend EU money on the built environment. And yes, we have come a long way uh, in the last two decades in disability rights, but it's not nearly enough. Presentations by Slovak, Hungarian and Czech colleagues will show us that we have to work harder because we cannot build even more barriers. We are here to discuss how we can improve the way EU funds are spent and implemented in member states. And we welcome enabling conditions for EU funds implementing CRPD, including Article 9. It is easy to say, but as you all know, it is harder to fulfill. We can discuss how will European Commission and the Member States monitor this condition in all supported projects. And uh, to conclude, let me be more personal again. I have convinced myself many times in my life that everything is related to everything. For us all to understand the importance of creating barrier-free public places accessible to all is a matter of setting our minds and our beliefs not only policymakers, but also the wide public. It starts with the education of our children. No one has to convince my son Dominic about this, because he was taught this in that inclusive kindergarten in Ottawa, through his friendship with little Robert. Overall, we need to talk more about problems and obstacles in the lives of people with disabilities in order to understand the senselessness of barriers, not only the technical and tangible ones, but also the abstract ones. Thank you. Thank you so much for these inspiring words. Now I'd like to pass the floor to um, MEP Atka Maksova. Um, for a few words, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed experts, ladies. Um, I think we are on a good way by today. Uh, today's event is um, uh, really a good example. And I support our uh, activity after this event to take a statement concerning accessibility of the European Parliament. 
Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers and also all the guests for taking, taking the time to participate in this very important event. Together we are discussing a topic that is uh, vital for approximately 87 million of European citizens who have some form of disability. Sadly, many of them do not have the same opportunities in life as people without disability. And this has to change. All people with disabilities must be treated as fully equal and must not be denied their fundamental rights. The topic of ensuring the rights of persons with disabilities is very close to my heart. Through, through my political career, I have worked on creating a more equal and inclusive society and I have defended the rights of people with disabilities. I have worked alongside them and I have represented their interests in the European Parliament. I thereby became familiar with many of the challenges that they face in their everyday lives. The purpose of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is to promote, protect and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities and to promote respect for their inherent dignity. The EU and its member states are its signatories, but despite the achievement, there is still a long way to go to achieve the goal of the Convention. For example, only half of persons with disabilities are employed compared to three in four persons without disabilities. This is due to barriers in the job market and also in education as well as other areas such as, for example, transport. Accessibility is a precondition for participation in society, and we must therefore ensure that everybody is fully accessible for people uh, with disabilities. As a member of Disability Intergroup Bureau and as a shadow rapporteur of uh, Strategy File uh, concerning people with disability, I advocate for the adoption of an ambitious strategy for rights of persons with disabilities for the period 2021 to 2030. This strategy has a number of initiatives that aim to improve the lives of persons with disabilities in Europe and around the world. One of such initiatives is the European Disability Card. I believe that the card will provide an easy way to recognize disability status when traveling in the whole EU and some associated benefits, usual on culture, sports and leisure activities, thereby attacking some of the existing barriers. Currently, the card is a pilot project in eight EU countries but the European Commission will present a proposal to expand it in 2023. I think that the Europe Accessibility Act was also a significant step in the right direction in order to improve the functioning of the internal market to accessible products and services by removing barriers created by divergent rules in member states. There are many more examples of great achievements, but there are also many areas for improvement, as I already mentioned, for example, today, European Parliament. Also, it is the European <coughs> and other public institutions that should set an example. It is regrettable that these institutions are still not sufficiently equipped and fully accessible for people with disabilities. It is striking that even the platform for the conference on the future of Europe, the aim of which was to enable European citizens to share their ideas and help shape our common future, was not made fully accessible to people with disabilities. The EU should continue to remove barriers without creating new ones. While we are already seeing positive developments, it is not enough and much more need to be done. When adopting legislation concerning the lives of European citizens, the principles of equal access and universal design should be promoted 
and apply to ensure the sustainability of the proposed solution for people with disabilities. We have to stay committed to improving the social and economic situation of persons with disabilities. We must work together to make European society inclusive for everyone. Thank you for your attention and for your work. Thank you so much. Um, I, um, in the original agenda, I was planning to talk about uh, why we did this project. <laughs> this was originally the idea was to feature um, our reasons uh, and just tell you, you know, how the accessibility situation is in uh, those three countries: in Slovakia, Czechia, and Hungary. I think after your words, uh, it is clear that we have an issue, and not only in those three countries, but uh, also here in Brussels. But I would still like to say a few words about uh, what I originally planned to talk about, um, and allow me to be academic here, uh, very briefly. Um, I want to talk about knowledge, and uh, how we learn. I think most people in the room have uh, probably several degrees. We spend a number of years in schools, in education. So we are prone to think that uh, knowledge comes from learning in schools, or in books, or in trainings, workshops. We learn because we, it's a cognitive process. We learn because it's a job to do uh, by our brains. I think when it comes to accessibility, the, the, the issue is much more complicated. Um, I can ask all of you that this morning on the way here when you approached the European Parliament building, do you remember the instances when you stepped on curbs, on pavements from the roads? Do you remember when you used the stairs in this building? Uh, do you have a mental map in your mind about Brussels city centre where you can use an accessible toilet when you really need to go? Because that's two streets away. I think learning, and some academics um, wrote excellent books about this, learning is also something that our body does. And I think disabled people have a unique knowledge in that, uh, something that is perhaps, as they call it, tacit or implicit knowledge, something that cannot be learned or taught in schools. Disabled people have to learn through their bodies that our cities are inaccessible. But the problem is that uh, I think many governments uh, and public authorities, including probably the European Parliament, are like non-disabled people. They don't know that they don't know. Because I'm, I'm a non-disabled person, I'm an able-bodied person. There's, there are a lot of things I don't know about how different bodies and different cognitive processes, how different minds work. I'm quite normal, as they say. I don't like this word, but uh, they would label me normal. So here's what I want to say. We created this project because there's a gap between what disabled people know through their tacit learning and through their bodies' everyday experiences in inaccessible cities. That is one thing. And on the other side, there are state authorities and governments who tell us in the face that the situation is okay because we have renovated those buildings. Look at that building, it's brand new, it is accessible, it has a ramp in the front. And there's a huge gap between the two, and our project was born out of this idea that we need to bridge this gap and we need to bring a strong message to policymakers who behave like non-disabled, able-bodied people with all their arrogance, that they think they know, to let them know that no, you don't even know what you don't know. This is why we did this project in the first place. What we did in this project, uh, was uh, that we basically created this knowledge in different forms. Uh, our project partners will shortly uh, present you with the, some of the activities we did in the three countries. We wrote up reports, we collected evidence about inaccessible buildings um, built recently by public money, including by EU funds. And we also did trainings, series of workshops for people uh, to better evaluate what accessibility is and what it might not be in the case of uh, the built environment. 
Yes, our focus is mostly on the built environment because uh, the organization I'm representing here is the National Association of uh, National Federation of Association of Persons with Physical Disabilities in Hungary. So naturally, we have a stronger focus on the built environment. But our project was inclusive in this way. We also included uh, the needs of people with uh, sensory impairments and people with uh, different minds, uh, people with learning disabilities or autism. Our evaluation uh, of buildings included those um, uh, issues as well. This is what I wanted to say briefly, and now I would like to ask one of you, whoever volunteers, Andre or Maria, to present what you did in the project. Let me present to you the, the outcomes of the project in Czech Republic. Just as our project partners, we created a situation analysis for Czech Republic to map the basic documents and the national legislative environment for accessibility. Czechia is going to, through a period of comprehensive recodification of building law. Uh, this document was also an occasion to reflect not only on the existing shortcomings, but also to think about in what direction we would like to move the accessibility issue. In this document, we presented specific legislative regulations, including the analysis, technical standards for accessibility, and their quality, described the level and scope of professional materials, methodologies, and platforms for sharing experiences. The long-time experience has clearly shown that the absence of a consent authority and the lack of knowledge and experience in this field of accessibility, accessible buildings by authorized persons lead to repeated mistakes and a waste of public funds. In the project, we also try to identify the possibilities and principles of mapping buildings and to look at good and bad examples from building practice. In Czechia, we have the so-called unified mapping methodology used since 2015, which was approved by the Ministry of Regional Development. The methodology uses the traffic light method to mark objects. The methodology also includes forms for recording technical parameters and measured values. And subsequently, uh, the overall accessibility of the building is assessed and corresponding pictogram assigned. It serves as information for persons with mobility impairments on the current state of accessibility of the building. Our colleagues from NEOS prepared the accessibility toolkit, which is simple and clear. Unlike the Czech uh, certified mapping methodology, methodology, it is based on the fact that the mapping will be carried out by untrained persons. And whereas the Czech methodology is done for people with uh, physical disabilities, this new one has a broader use also for other types of disabilities. In the good practices document, the methodologies have been deliberately combined to assess the selected buildings in the best possible way. Mapping accessibility of buildings can point out defects or poor solutions and can also serve the owner or manager of the building as proposal of specific solutions to eliminate the deficiencies. It is a very necessary way in which architectural barriers could start being effectively removed. We also organize several trainings for NGOs, building industry representatives and officials, where we presented the accessibility toolkit and other project outcomes. Although it is not always really possible to get to know how a building was financed, we can say that in Czech Republic a big part of newly built or reconstructed buildings are funded from EU funds, as we are one of the biggest users of those funds. However, many of the constructions create new barriers. In Czechia, generally speaking, the legislation in force is not being complied with because the accessibility requirements are quite complex and the obligation to comply with them applies to all actors in the construction process, designer, investor, building authority, building contractor, etc. There are certainly not enough accessibility experts. 
Actually, only a few dozen um, people, mostly from non-profit organizations. There is a lack of methodologies, professional documents, and training modules. Accessibility is mainly the responsibility of the so-called building authorities, but their officials do not have enough experience or training to check the details. In 2015, the concluding observations of the UNCRPD committee made a clear recommendation to clearly define which bodies have the mandate to monitor the implementation of the Building Act on ensuring accessibility. Unfortunately, up to now, this requirement has not been met. Such an authority that would supervise and monitor accessibility of buildings could check compliance with the legislation in force, issue certificates of accessibility, create a platform for sharing experience, strengthen education on accessible, accessible architecture, etc. Whereas now, non-profit organizations try to be a substitute for this authority, but are often not respected. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Maria? Uh, I would like to share a short presentation uh, based on the example and findings in the Slo Slovakia. Uh, we also did have, uh, I will try to use the clicker, but it's probably too far, <laughs> so if I can ask you. So uh, uh, also as a result of our, our uh, background analysis, Slovakia also ratified uh, UNCRPD and also we do have a uh, legal context of uh, anti-discrimination act uh, that built the very strong uh, strong uh, form where someone can argue and sue the Slovak Republic uh, based on inaccessibility uh, and we also now are in the process when uh, we still have a very old one building act and degrees uh, but uh, uh, and but in force there uh, will be in a one and a half year new building legislation and this is something when regarding uh, regarding uh, the process of uh, uh, implementation of structural funds that uh, creates a little little uh, un unsecureness how this uh, how the managing authority will uh, will somehow cope with this situation that the old one is ending and the new one is still not uh, finished yet. Um, but what we did also, we did very similar activities than in uh, Czech and Hungary. We did made uh, uh, trainings in, uh, in, uh, in person in Kosice and Bratislava, which are the two biggest cities in Slovakia, with persons with disabilities uh, and we also did uh, uh, workshops with experts and what we have learned uh, uh, we all together agreed that uh, the officials of the public services often lack awareness about the actual inaccessibility what Gabor was trying to say that sometimes they don't even know what they don't know and therefore our friends from Kosice uh, started with uh, uh, sh uh, going to the public buildings and this is the town hall of Kosice and in the next picture you can see uh, that the inaccessibility is uh, uh, at the entrance solved with this um, uh, lift uh, that someone should call and someone hopefully will come uh, this was something what we, we were, uh, what Slovak legislation concerns that this is okay. Uh, and on the next uh, picture you can see that uh, next week, uh, last week, a town, Kosice Town Hall started to uh, reconstruct the main entrance. But according to their visualization on the next picture, the main entrance still will be not accessible. Um, and this is something what we uh, what we see, and and the town hall is okay with this because the uh, the entrance from the site is accessible, as you could see. Uh, but on the other side, there is a, there are several uh, activities uh, that uh, 
the public authorities reflected very well, like the Bratislava city, but also uh, the, some of the schools. Uh, when they called the, the, these advocates to access their buildings and in the plans, they would like to, uh, in the future, uh, uh, adapt. Uh, the lack uh, th that we agree that there is a large lack of educational programs for the experts, for the engineers, for the architects that basically uh, plan the buildings, but on the other side, there is a very unsatisfactory uh, implementation of the existing legislation in practice. And this includes uh, the monitoring system also uh, by the EU funds. Um, what we, where we see the role of the EU and public investments, as uh, Andre said, uh, the, amount, the amount of uh, uh, or the role of EU funding in uh, public investments increased in the member states uh, in the last programming period and Slovakia um, is one of the biggest users also and uh, the access to this money is uh, for the municipalities very very uh, very easy because uh, they co-finance is only by five percent so they use this money uh, and what we really need is that uh, EU should set the standards uh, because we, and as it was said, that there is an enabling condition in this new programming period, but, uh, but uh, the managing authority is still looking at this as okay, they have the building permit, then it's okay, but we see as an outcome that it's not so, uh, for example, the energy efficiency, and we can go to the next pictures. Uh, in this programming period, there was a lot of money spent on the energy efficiency, and he here you can see one uh, police um, office building for, where public, or where is the, also the center for clients, uh, where is a ramp, but after the a reconstruction they didn't change the door so there are still two doors with the uh, and so so basically uh, they did something but not not uh, not uh, enough and also uh, on the next picture as a kindergarten very nice efficiency but this is the uh, ramp to the door um, small things you could say, but uh, this is not really accessibility. And this is the question we should all ask, and I would like to end with this, um, that we know that the Green Deal is important for our future, but also design for all is. And it's a, it's a right and necessity for at least 10 to 30% of people but also um, for half of us, at least in, a, in some parts of our life, it's uh, very convenient and uh, necessary. But for all of us, it, it makes, creates environment that is more comfortable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I would like to get my slides up on the screen, if possible. Um, yes. So, uh, what we did at Meros in Hungary uh, under this project, next slide, please. We, um, similarly to our partners, we did uh, two important studies. The first was a situation analysis, uh, and we hired two veteran architects, uh, rehabilitation engineers to write this up for us. They have 20 years of experience uh, trying to design buildings according to the best standards of universal design. And these, these two authors wrote an excellent uh, series of case studies where they told us anonymized stories of uh, actual building constructions where they went to the planners and the owners and those who had the money the investors and tell them what needs to be done and starting from scratch starting from very good or excellent plans for buildings
they ended up some, with something that was uh, really unsatisfactory, not accessible. These case studies open a window on uh, the, the reality of uh, practice that is outside laws. And I think that is one of the conclusions of this uh, situation analysis, that uh, although some laws and policies in Hungary do need to be improved, uh, for example, sometimes they are inconsistent, uh, the definitions they are using are incoherent um, or unclear, but more focus needs to be put on practice. What happens when money is spent? And I think this is why it is uh, just overly important that we are here where the money is spent, where people decide about the fate of that EU money that goes to member states. More rigorous monitoring uh, is needed to follow up uh, uh, that money that is spent on bricks and concrete. Next slide, please. Um, this situation analysis I mentioned earlier was uh, really a lot of words, you know, it's a proper study that is quite hard to read, but we also wanted to create something that is more easy to read for the wider audience. So we did a good practices report that is not really a collection of good practices, but a compilation of good and not so good practices. You can see the map of Hungary on the screen with the buildings we evaluated. We, that includes uh, 15 different buildings across the country. Um, I think with the exception of two, all had systemic problems. All had problems that excluded people from using those buildings. These included train station, government office where you need to do your ID card or whatever benefits you're applying for, kindergarten, newly built kindergarten, secondary school, university, museum, the health center, state-run health center, culture center, etc. Some of these examples are included in the background document we sent out to all participants before the event. Now there's a gap between um, uh, building standards and uh, actually built buildings uh, that they should use these standards. Next slide, please. And this is one example that we can show. This is a recently renovated secondary school in rural Hungary in the south of the country where this platform, uh, help me out here, Pentecost, how do you call this in English, this moving platform? Is it a moving platform? Uh, stair lift. So it's a stair lift. Uh, this stair lift, there are several statements in Hungary, professional statements by architects, including a statement by the National Federation of Persons with Physical Disabilities that these stair lifts are not to be used. They are often unsafe, they are unreliable, sometimes they are stuck in the middle, they should not be used. When they renovated this building, they shouldn't have used this stair lift in the first place. Um, and you can't really see it on the photo, but the entrance of this building is also too narrow for many wheelchair users. And there are also a number of issues inside the building. So, as I said earlier, there are a lot of things we don't know that we should know. So I think if I could wish for one uh, outcome of this event today, some EU institutions, whichever can put money into it, um, should conduct a thorough study exploring how member states, when they implement EU money, how they are using that money from the perspective of accessibility. I think there are a lot of surprises waiting for us uh, out there. Uh, surprises like this. This building is clearly not accessible for uh, wheelchair users, students, young people who wish to study there. Next slide, please. We also did training sessions and workshops. Uh, we reached uh, around uh, 45 um, activists. We trained them on using that toolkit that Andre mentioned. We developed that toolkit so that lay people without prior training in, in architecture or engineering can evaluate whether a building is up to the latest universal design standards. We trained them and we also equipped them with uh, advocacy toolkit. Uh, model letters and some advice, personalized, uh, personalized advice. So when they, for instance, evaluate a post office in a village and they see that it's inaccessible, what they can do about it? Uh, where they can go with this information, where they can ask for remedies for change. We also held uh, a workshop a few weeks ago for um, public officers working in ministries and the public authorities. Um, the title of that workshop was How We Can Support Accessibility in Projects because there's a lot that they can do at their desks when they, uh, when they are uh, launching public procurement, uh, for instance. And already our trained activists are about to launch uh, probably we are around 10 evaluations that have been done around the country 
and complaints are being made at uh, local or regional authorities to change those buildings uh, um, for, for the better. Next slide is this one. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say and I would also like to add two uh, more things before I pass the floor to um, Tanya Casas from the European Disability Forum. We are slightly late, um, so uh, Ima uh, Plasencia Correro is with us, I think, remotely. If it's okay with you, uh, she's not. Is she? Yes, she is. If Ima, you can, um, you can wait 10 more minutes, that would be fine. If not, just let us know somehow, and, I, and you can uh, continue uh, after this. What I wanted to add are two important things. These examples that Maria, Andre, and I referred to, these mistakes or errors in accessibility, these are not exceptions. We claim, and this is why we are doing this event, we claim that these are systemic problems in all three countries, systemic problems, not standalone singular cases. So because they are systemic problems, I think EU institutions have a duty, they are signatories to the CRPD, they are bound by the, by the Charter of Fundamental Rights, um, to do something about it, to explore and act. The other issue uh, is that maybe you think sometimes that these errors or mistakes in accessibility are small ones, but actually even small mistakes uh, result in building arrangements that are unsafe to use or exclude a lot of people, and that constitutes discrimination. So it's a legal case. These are the two issues I wanted to add. They are systemic discrimination cases. So now I will pass it on to Daniel, unless Ima said something that maybe she... No? Okay, then Daniel, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. And first of all, thanks a lot for inviting the European Disability Forum to, to this event. And I think that the topic for all of us is quite relevant, uh, the relationship between accessibility and new funds and the problems also exist in the European Parliament. So the discussion is quite um, timely. Uh, what I'll try to do uh, with my brief interventional presentation is try to explain why accessibility is important, why the European Union is acting on this field, what are the tools that the European Union has created, and finally, what is our experience, what are the challenges that we find when using or implementing those tools. As it has been said, uh, the importance of accessibility is that it's a precondition for persons with disabilities to live independently and to fully and equally participate in society. And it is necessary for the enjoyment of most of our rights, access to education, to employment, to political participation, to culture, and also independent living. Uh, what's important about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is that it creates an obligation to the European Union and to the member states to promote accessibility and universal design. And they have plenty of tools at their disposal to do so. They have their budget, and they also have their regulatory powers. The use budget, which is quite important, and also competencies in areas such as the internal market have granted presence um, with important powers to shape and push for the consideration of accessibility in relevant aspects of life. This is the design and the provision of goods and services, ICT, which is increasingly gaining importance, public procurement, and even transport. Um, it must also be taken into account in today's event that those powers coexist with those of the member states who have the main responsibility in this field. And also, from a European point of view, member states, together with the Parliament, are those who negotiate European legislation, who transpose European legislation, and also when we talk about the European budget and funds, such as the cohesion funds, and regional funds, they are responsible for the implementation. So with this introduction, I wanted to say that the European Union has a legal obligation to promote accessibility, and also that it has competencies in this field. So what has this has the European done uh, so far uh, in this context? Well, from a legislative point of view, uh, I think the activity has been quite intense. Uh, in the ICT field, we have important pieces of legislation we have made the change. Um, we have the Web Accessibility Directive, which obliges public authorities to have accessible websites and also applications. We have the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, which deals with TV broadcast and on-demand platforms and also includes accessibility um, provisions. And we have the electronic communications codes that deals with uh, telephone services, access to internet, and also emergency communications. 
from a transport point of view, we have the DMT regulation, which is being, um, I would say, revised and negotiated at the moment, which establishes accessibility requirements in the development of transport infrastructure. We have the TSI PRM regulation, which is quite technical, but it has been an important change because it introduced accessibility requirements for the design of train stations and train vehicles. And also the passenger rights legislative framework, which is being also revised, which has obliged transport carriers to offer assistance, to provide accessible information and complaint mechanisms, and also to be liable in the event of lost and damaged um, air mobility equipment. But I'm, I'm not forgetting about the most important piece of legislation, which is the European Accessibility Act, which has been a long demand from the disability um, movement. What this directive does is oblige public authorities and also economic operators, that is, um, businesses, to make certain products and services um, accessible. But what is really important about this piece of legislation is that for the first time it creates some kind of clarification and legal certainty on what accessibility is. Also, it creates a link with public procurement regulation, and also it establishes that any product or service complying with the accessibility requirements that are uh, within the law within the accessibility of, um, we fulfill accessibility obligations set out in other legal acts. With that, I mean that if the European uh, Commission wants to propose a legislation in another field and wants to ensure strong accessibility requirements, can refer to the Accessibility Act to do so. Um, apart from the legislation, as I said, another important tool is the budget, and the European budget um, is quite big. And with the Common Provisions Regulation, there is an obligation to take into account accessibility in certain new funds when implementing them. And some of those funds, which are especially relevant for persons with disabilities, are the regional funds or the social funds. So there is an obligation to take into consideration accessibility when implementing those funds. And finally, there is public procurement. Uh, public procurement is important because uh, the government is a big spender and buyer of goods and services, and it can also influence how those goods and services are designed and can push for accessibility in this respect. So the directive on public procurement um, is important because also obliges to take into consideration accessibility uh, when assessing the quality of a tender and also when specifying the, the, the technical requirements of, of goods and services. Um, but that, that's not all. We all have legislation, we have budget, but also we have standards, and standards, they are important because they explain how those legal obligations related to accessibility can be implemented. <coughs> uh, so far we have three standards, which have already uh, been referred to, standards on the built environment, on the ICT, and also on design for all. And with the European Accessibility Act, three new standards um, will be developed. So with this technical part, I would say the three main ideas that we should keep in mind is that First, at the, at the international, European, and national level, there are obligations that for uh, public authorities and private actors to ensure accessibility. That there is a budget that can ensure also accessibility because um, accessibility is an investment, it requires money, and this money is there. And the third thing is that standards provide the technical specifications that can help us achieve accessibility. So taking into account all these tools that we have at our disposal, what has been the challenges that we have faced. I would say the first one is to understand that accessibility is a transversal issue, it's not only a sectorial one. So accessibility needs not only to be considered when it comes from the ministry dealing with disability, it needs to be implemented in all laws and policies affecting uh, citizens. And as I said, uh, with the European Accessibility Act, the accessibility requirements are there and it's a tool that we can use. The second challenge also is the limited scope of important accessibility legislation. For example, the European Accessibility Act excludes certain products and services that are important, such as home appliances and also certain transport modes. The third challenge, which is extremely relevant, is also that um, legislation is differently implemented in member states. And this is the case because the, the legal form that certain laws take are a directive. That means that, that there are minimum requirements that are set and general objectives that need to be achieved. But the way this is done depends on, on, on the member states' willingness um, to do so. And the fourth challenge, and I think it's relevant to today's, is the difficult enforcement and implementation of EU funds. Um, so the conclusion um, in my intervention uh, was that what we see is that legal obligations and tools 
uh, to advance accessibility already exists. What it lacks is the willingness to implement them properly. Sometimes uh, policy makers and, and economic operators say that this is a cost that we should see it as a right and as an investment. And it has been proved that accessibility is beneficial for all the citizens and that if it is included from the outset, it's also uh, cost effective. So thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I think we really need the input from uh, Ima Placencia from the European Commission, maybe to clarify uh, some things around the Accessibility Act and how it's applicable uh, when using the funds. Uh, so I will uh, pass it on to Ima, if she's in the room. Yes, we just. Can you please press on the speak button once, please? Miss Passenger? Only once? Yes. We can see, but we cannot hear you. So we are going to refresh quickly your connection. Okay, so we can still not hear you. I'm going to send you now um, a request. Can you accept it? Okay, can you now press on the speak button once? Yes, can yes. you hear me now? Now we can hear you, yes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so, well, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation uh, uh, to these very interesting events. I think, uh, uh, it is really important that uh, the imp implementation of the funds accessibility is um, really uh, respected and, uh, and implemented. What I'm going to say is a little bit um, yeah, uh, related to what Daniel just said, because in fact he presented the work I've been doing, <laughs> in which I have been involved and have been doing for, for many years. And I would like to, to start by saying that um, fortunately, we do have now a um, quite comprehensive set of legislation and uh, standards at, um, at uh, European level for accessibility. We have been for many years um, uh, putting forward uh, and working on, uh, on these um, um, legal, uh, legal acts and uh, standards in order to make sure that when there is an obligation for doing accessibility, it would be known what is exactly that one has to do. So this is really um, the first message that um, I uh, wanted to, to give you. When it comes to the funds, um, I would like to, to indicate that there is a clear obligation uh, to uh, implement uh, the, or use the funds in respecting accessibility. Article 9 of the Common Provision Regulations um, in relation to horizontal principles clearly uh, indicates that um, uh, accessibility for persons with disabilities shall be taken into account throughout the preparation and implementation of uh, programs. Also, we have uh, got um, in, um, in Article um, 73 on the uh, selection of the operations that uh, managing authorities shall establish and apply criteria and procedures which are not discriminatory, transparent, and they have to ensure accessibility for persons with disabilities. Now, 
These two articles um, together uh, clearly spell out the obligation. What is in addition very important is that um, uh, linked to Article 15 of the Common Provision Regulations, we have got Annex 3. And Annex 3 contains what is called the um, enabling conditions, the uh, horizontal enabling conditions. With these horizontal enabling conditions, um, there are um, obligations to um, do uh, uh, certain uh, elements in different areas that, um, that um, uh, uh, relate, have to be done, sorry, have to be done in advance. It's a kind of preparatory work that has to be done in advance uh, of spending the money to be ready to spend that, uh, to be ready to spend that money, if I may say this in a very unorthodox uh, legal, uh, legal terms. So, one of those horizontal conditions that apply across all the funds is uh, one for the implementation and application of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, and it contains three criteria in order to make sure that, it's, um, that it is fulfilled. First, it requires a, a national framework to ensure the implementation of the UN CRPD is in place. So there must be a framework that is ready and in place. And um, the second criteria under this um, enabling condition relates to um, um, the fact that that framework needs to include arrangements to ensure that the accessibility policy, legislation and standards are properly reflected in the preparation and implementation of the programs. In other words, before uh, the programs are um, started, so to put it that way, uh, and the preparation and um, the implementation of the programs, accessibility must be uh, present. In addition to, to these uh, uh, three articles, I would like also to refer to two, to two other ones. One is uh, the uh, fact that the monitoring committees um, uh, is as reflected in the third criteria um, of this enabling condition that says reporting arrangements for the monitoring committee regarding cases of non-compliance of operations supported by the funds with the UN CRPD and complaints regarding to the UN CRPD submitted in accordance with the arrangements made in Article 69 so so so. So what does this mean? Is that in the enabling conditions there should be arrangements for reporting non-compliance. And here is where also accessibility, non-compliance with accessibility can be reported and uh, the monitoring committee needs to take action. In addition, we have um, a reference uh, to um, the evaluation, is Article 44, that indicates uh, it contains a reference to non-discrimination. And in that context, um, discrimination to persons with disability uh, and issues related to accessibility uh, would be, um, would be, um, could be evaluated. Now, um, these are the provisions of the funds themselves. So there is no doubt about the obligations, there is no doubt about the preparatory work that has to be done and the um, implementation um, and monitoring during implementation. Let me um, say that um, this uh, regulation does not enter into detail of what is accessibility. And that is where we have a number of uh, instruments that interplay with this regulation. First, of course, we cannot forget the um, uh, UNCRPD and Article 9. Article 9 makes very clear that um, uh, accessibility concerns the physical environment, transportation, information and communication, including information and communication technologies, and other facilities open or provided to the public, both in rural and urban areas. This means that um, when we look to accessibility, these are really elements that uh, um, need to be um, uh, paid, uh, paid attention to. to. Now, still, we don't know what is accessibility. The Convention does not define accessibility, does not, put, does not put technical obligations on accessibility. And here is where EU legislation enters into play. 
as uh, Daniel has said, we have um, transport related legis legislation, um, we have got um, the European Accessibility Act, we have got um, the Web Accessibility Directive, um, and public procurement. Well, I would like to say that when it comes to the contents of what is accessibility, this, um, the European Accessibility Act is the uh, document that um, contains, um, I would say, more, um, more uh, uh, detailed, uh, detailed comments. It contains an annex, Annex 1, uh, that um, uh, contains requirements, functional accessibility requirements for products and services under the Act. Now, uh, Daniel referred to it as a very limited, but uh, I would like to say it is very uh, wide and rich. For why? Because it contains really all kinds of computers, operating systems, really in the, um, electronic communication services, artificial media services, and even contains in Alex 3 um, requirements for the built environment. Now, um, the Act uh, interplays with um, the regulations, the fund regulations, but also with public procurement. Let's not forget that a lot of the money of the funds is spent through public procurement. In the public procurement directives, um, in the public procurement directives, we have um, an article on technical specifications, that is Article 42, that indicates that whenever uh, the contracting authority will um, prepare the technical specifications, accessibility for persons with disabilities has to be considered whenever the subject matter of what is bought, the subject matter of the contract, is going to be used by people. And it doesn't matter whether it is internally for personnel working in the uh, organization or whether it is um, um, what the contracting authority is buying for the use of the public. Um, so imagine that you buy computers for um, your own, uh, their own ministry, or that you develop a website for communicating to the public, accessibility must be there. In addition, um, accessibility in Article 67 um, is reflected in the awarding of the contract. So it can be a, a, an element for which you can give extra points to um, select one bid or, um, or another. Um, in, so you do not need to go for the cheapest price, you can really introduce accessibility as one of the criteria that you are going to give points for selecting. There is also accessibility in, in the quality assurance of the standards, uh, the standards, so there is a link with the standardization and um, um, on the principle there are other uh, relevant elements that I'm not going to enter into detail. I'm switching now to the Europe, back again to the European Accessibility Act. The European Accessibility Act contains two important articles in this context, is Article 24 and 25. And Article 24 makes very clear that the products and services in the Act must be bought using the accessibility criteria of um, the accessibility requirements in Annex 1 of the Act. But it also says that if you buy other products, for example, domestic appliances, that um, um, Daniel was referring to, and um, when you buy those um, domestic appliances, um, if you use the accessibility requirements of Annex 1, um, for particular features, elements, or functions that they have, for example, for the user interface, you would be provided, um, pro um, you would be provided presumption of fulfillment of those obligations on accessibility. And this is not only for public procurement, this is also for the funds, because what it says is that um, it refers uh, to um, 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 the fact that uh, it refers to relevant obligations set out in Union Acts other than this directive. So, when uh, funds uh, money is spent and you buy and you buy finance whatever where there is an obligation of accessibility, then for the features, elements, and functions for which there are uh, in Annex One functional requirements. You can apply those requirements and get fulfillment and um, presumption of fulfillment. 
The point is that the Act enters into application in 2025 and the funds are already operational. So what can we do in the meantime? Well, we can do a lot because in addition to that, we have got European standards. And um, those standards are the results of uh, European standardization mandates. The Commission asked the European standardization organizations to develop, um, to develop standards. We have um, a standard uh, in the built environment, um, contains very detailed functional requirements, EN 17161, uh, sorry, 17, sorry, EN 17210, accessibility and usability in the built environment, and uh, this standard can be used in the context of, of um, the funds to say how built environment is accessible. We also have got um, a standard on ICT, EN301549, and this describes all kinds of ICT functionality, including products and services. Now, um, that standard also can be used in the context of the funds. Um, and uh, finally, a design for all standard, which is um, a standard that, is, that says how and what an organization needs to do in order to ensure that the results um, that they produce, whether it's products, services, um, uh, whatever process, um, it is accessible for persons with disabilities. So these three standards are three. By the way, the Commission also issued uh, another mandate um, to the, uh, in the context of the European Accessibility Act to develop three new standards. One um, related to uh, non-digital information, how non-digital information is standard, uh, can be um, made accessible. Then another one related to um, um, emergency communications, access to 112. And uh, the third one is about support services. The directive relates to help desk, call centers, technical supports, relay services. So how this can be made accessible for persons with disabilities. I would like also to clarify one thing on the Accessibility Act. The Accessibility Act is one of the pieces of the puzzle. Very important. But it needs to be seen in the context of bringing together all these other pieces of legislation at European level. I mentioned some, but we also have the Electronic Communication Code, the Audiovisual Media Service Directive, the Electronic Signatures Regulation. So there are many. And it is one of the important pieces of the puzzle. Why is it so important? Because it contains accessibility requirements. Does it contain all the requirements? No, of course. There are other um, uh, requirements for um, are elements which are not covered uh, in the standard because they uh, sorry in the act because they are covered somewhere else. I will give you an example. The Accessibility Act contains requirements, for example, for in the area of transport, for um, for uh, information, for self-service terminals, for websites, uh, for electronic tickets. Well, when you finance through the funds or you purchase via with the public procurement directives or in accordance with the public procurement directives to be more correct and um, a transport service you can use the accessibility requirements um, or of, of the act for those features elements or um, functions which are in the act so you could do it for in the service to uh, for the information, for the uh, self-service terminals, for the checking machines, for the electronic ticketing, and so forth. But the Act does not cover vehicles. Why does the Act does not cover vehicles? It is because there are other uh, EU legislation related to that, or international provisions to which the EU has adhered to. For example, the low platform buses. So when you design your to, to buy or to finance such a service for the those elements I mentioned, you can use the requirements of the Act. For the um, vehicle, the low platform bus, for example, you have to use, you, know, you can use, or you, have, you are obliged to, to, to use to the extent that it contains obligation, the, 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 the low platform bus, um, the, lo, the low platform buses regulation, so, um, directive. So, um, this, with this, I um, hope I have provided you with um, an overview of the provisions that are in the structure of funds, um, regulations uh, requiring accessibility. I have also provided you with an overview of the procurement um, obligations 
and also um, the tools that can be used to render operational those general accessibility requirements by using um, and, um, the Annex 1 of the European Accessibility Act and other uh, um, EU legislation and, of course, the three standards. With this, I finish my uh, presentation and I remain available in case there are questions. Thank you. Um, I think now it would be a good time to hold our roundtable because Susanna Postman unfortunately couldn't make it today uh, from the United Nations OHCHR. And we are honored to welcome uh, Mr. Kim Polopoulos in the room. Um, you were not here, but at the beginning we were, sh beginning we were shocked to see that uh, the podium in this room was inaccessible. So we decided to cut the meeting short and uh, um, finish earlier and then make a statement together, recorded by video, that we have uh, thanks to uh, EDF staff who have a camera. So um, I suggest that now we don't forget what we are here for. Let's discuss accessibility and how it can be improved uh, in the scope of uh, EU legislation. That will be a sort of virtual round table. Um, Maria uh, from Socia Slovakia, Bendegus from Meos, uh, Hungary, uh, Mr. Kim Poulos, uh, Ms. Langen Zippen, and uh, Ms. Maxova, and uh, Ms. Julius Nikosanova, um, and Daniel. My question would be, um, I think we can do it um, briefly a bit longer, but the main thing is that we discuss and we propose maybe things and agree on something to act. What do you think, based on what uh, Ima told us, uh, it seems like a quite comprehensive package that the EU can use to, to pursue uh, improvements included in a member state level. What do you think, how the EU institution can best act to improve accessibility when using EU funds. Perhaps, Mr. Kim Kuropoulos. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I feel uh, a little bit sad. <coughs> a little bit sad of the fact that uh, we still need to discuss about the web accessibility is and uh, how we consider that something, whatever it is, something accessible. Just, I think, very much. Uh, for these wonderful uh, words, but the one point is that I think we live in the era of sorry for that, words, words, words. And uh, if we don't have an inaccessibility in this house, what are we what are we going to talk about in the future for the member states? And the problem is not only here in this area, but also let's say in the hand. How is it for me to have uh, a podium to like to be accessed by myself? <coughs> by myself or by other for it to be using the reason or the sign language. How easy for somebody who who has uh, another impediment, easy to go to, to, to be impressed and to have uh, an easy access. Uh, I would still say that just to remember that we have a tools, we have a uh, disability strategy, we know the direction, but uh, we don't know uh, which parts uh, we need to step on in order to reach this direction. Uh, my final comment is that we need to define and generate what is a big means, what is a means. Because if we are going to find and generate small group goals, this is not accessible. And this is not something that we need support, we will help support from our side. So, yes, accessibility, but where? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, who would like to? Yes. 
Yes, uh, I think that uh, Mr. Kimperopoulos is uh, very much right, uh, that we have dozens, thousands uh, of words on a piece of paper, but that's about it. We have all the studies, we have all the numbers, I don't know how many studies have been done on the accessibility. I mean, we do have the information, we just don't listen. We don't, we don't listen to people like, like you, because we live here in the bubble. bubble. I mean, it's really a bubble, very... Uh, far away from the reality and we think that if we gather together so many information and read you read all the paper uh, all the all the papers then that's enough but it's not enough because uh, in reality we just haven't done much and this very room is the vivid example and vivid proof of uh, you know how accessible are the public places for people with disabilities. And, uh, you know, now they brought some things, they made it accessible, but I wonder why all our rooms, especially when we know that the members of European Parliament, you know, are using wheelchairs or, or you know, they need to be uh, able to access uh, those uh, public places in this very, very building. So, and the authorities, when we asked for this room, they had all the information. I mean, do we really, in the 21st century, write them that pay attention, there will be people in wheelchairs? Why don't we take it as something that is so natural, right? Because I mean, through this, we really created like second-class citizens from the people who are on wheelchairs in this very room attending this event on accessibility. So for me, okay, we listened that uh, we have all these tons of, of papers, but uh, you know, I mean, what is the reality about? And, the reality, you know, to me, I can see it now. It's 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 very very sad. So I think we should we should change um, the policy making upside down. I mean, we should ask you what we should do actually, really, in order to deliver these tons of papers to the people who make the right or wrong decision because they are not even aware of it. It was very. It is always boring to to listen to, you know, um, policies that are on paper, especially when you don't see them in reality. So yes, thank you. Very shortly. It's very difficult to change something because we try with uh, Catherine and Disability Intergroup push European Parliament, half of uh, head of European Parliament to set up a focal point for people with disabilities in European Parliament. It is not possible because the highest officer said it costs money, we need person, it, no, it is not possible. The second, second thing. We try to set up one chair in a high horizontal level group which is responsible for equality. Three years, we, we sent maybe three letters to Bureau of European Parliament, no response. And uh, when I asked Mr. Papadimopoulos, uh, who is responsible for this, he said, no answer is answer. Uh, I was really shocked because it is equality in European Parliament. We need to push more uh, uh, offic of officers, officials, head of European Parliament, uh, the chair of European Parliament, because maybe we as politicians want much, but we have any burden in. Uh, Office of European Parliament, and now uh, we have here a lot of uh, assistance with uh, some kind of disability, and they say it's horrible because we uh, had to wait three, four, 
months for go inside the European Parliament. We couldn't find accommodation in Brussels. We have a lot of speeches, but very less level of uh, action. And uh, we try now, maybe should we establish the RPD um, a point in EMPA committee, mm -hmm. if I have, uh, if you can say something about it, because it is a big step, I think, for visibility. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for all your statements. Uh, we have no lack of knowledge. Um, so, and we as, let's say, persons as disabilities, with disabilities, it's not our job to explain or to yeah, can you change, share your information with us? We haven't knew it before. Uh, can you explain what we non-disabled should do? It's not my job. Yet in the Parliament, I remember when Madame Metzula presented or post, presented herself in, in our group. I asked her on um, how, what are the the plans or her plans. Uh, when she will be uh, the president of the parliament uh, when it comes to accessibility. Um, she said, she, yeah, she want to change it. And we are talking about Brussels. We are not talking about the, the twin in Strasbourg, where it's the same. This, I even can't open the toilet door because it's so strong. Um, I need help or I, inf I inform my team I will go to the toilet when I'm not back in five minutes, please look after me. So that is not the job of my personal assistant, and it's not the and it's a, it's a guy. So uh, so I don't want to have the case that my male assistant um, head of the office is following me to the toilet. Um, but that is the reality we are talking about when it comes to accessibility. And um, here it's the job of Madame Metzula, crystal clear. She is the boss of the house. Um, and we, as you said, we try to push for a kind of a sort of committee, what we will, um, or to, to strengthen the uh, UNCRPD network. And here it must be clear uh, what is the role of the disability intergroups, the disability network, and a disability framework. Ask here our colleagues in the house, they don't know. Um, so I think we should strengthen one body. So. The idea of uh, strengths in the network is a very good one. Um, we need experts, personnel with disabilities in the house. So if there is a guy or a person with disability uh, who is booking rooms, she or he will know, okay, I have to look after how accessible is the room or not. Um, so there are many things to do. We have uh, adopted the Accessible Youth Center. That is a start. Uh, that was uh, pushed by EDF. So we are cooperating together, EDF and we as MEPs. Um, but maybe not loud enough. And maybe we should think about in another moment uh, what our steps could be. Uh, now we will leave the room for a little demonstration. That is the first step for today, and um, maybe uh, it will help you in there. Um, but we really have to talk about it and find, okay, is there something concrete we can work on and not, please, please, Madame Metzula, could you, if you have time, would be wonderful. Uh, we are here in peace. We have to do a job and not looking for accessibility or non-accessible um, non rooms. That is not our business. I have better things to do. Sorry for that, but yeah, let's let's move on. Let's fight for. Thank you. Um, we are deeply honored, I think, with Socia and NRCP and NEOS. Uh, if we can bring about change in the European Parliament, it's not what we dreamed of originally, but we also have our duty in our, mem our member states. So, just briefly going back to our original question, what can the EU do about the better and more accessible implementation of EU funds? I have uh, Maria and Florian Sanden as well, um, apologies, Florian didn't mention you earlier, from ENIL, European Network on Independent Living. And Daniel, would you like to just to have a short run before we wrap up and then we do what we planned to do? Um, do you have anything to say or proposals what uh, EU institutions could do? Maria. 
thank you. Uh, I think that we, we definitely would uh, welcome <coughs> if the member states and managing authorities will be strongly encouraged <laughs> to, um, to focus on prevention. Uh, you know, before opening call, calls, uh, we know that there should be some kind of uh, lectures, trainings for, for, the, for the architects, for the, for the public authorities, just to prevent preparing the projects that are inaccessible. Because we know that the process is so long, the building permits and everything, and when, when we will somehow focus only on the evaluation of the project in the, uh, in the structural plans, we lose time, you know? So, so we need to focus on prevention. That is uh, something what's not really common, in, uh, at least in Slovakia. <laughs> Thank you. And Agus, would you like to add something as a trained architect? Where do you see uh, room for you? Yes, please. I'd like to add that I'm really deeply shocked here today and that uh, I started this fight 30 years ago when I was 20. I'm 50 now. And I don't see results. I don't see my life uh, being better. I don't see that uh, my life has a higher level of equal opportunities. And, um, but I hear a lot of talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking by doing nothing, almost, almost nothing. Here and Hungary also. So, in my future, because first of all I'm a person in this area and I'm doing a vision, I'd like to see some change finally, some practical change. Me myself, I'm also reading and writing, I'm a journalist and writer, so I like to talk and write and talk and write. But because I'm an engineer, I also do, like to do things, to build things, to change things. And um, I came home from Sweden, I went home from Sweden to Hungary to change Hungary. I went home uh, from California to change Hungary. I spent 25 years uh, doing my best in Hungary. And now it seems that uh, I participated, I assisted to build a, which is completely, completely ignoring the rights and the lives of uh, disabled persons also. So today I can't say anything which would uh, make any progress. We can talk more. We can talk for another 30 years, 50 years, and do little, almost nothing. That will change nothing. So. I think my suggestion would be that finally we could finally really start doing, talking and doing also in the same time something. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bendek. It was very powerful. Uh, Floria? Yes, I can go ahead. Thank you, uh, Gabo, giving me the floor. Um, what we're hearing, I feel we're here in China again when we talk to uh, representatives of uh, well, the executives, um, commission or national administrations, obviously, have, that everything is, the legislation is uh, perfect and the implementation is going superb, but we're still seeing all these problems, so how can this be? Um, I think we, um, it's important that we don't uh, let the policy make us uh, off, off the hook and um, continue to have a close look at all these different regulations that we mentioned today. Um, and if, check if they're really if they're really foolproof. Like the Accessibility Act does not include physical environments, for example, um, public procurement, state aid, or new taxonomy. Um, is it really um, <coughs> conducive to more accessibility? Um, uh, but when it comes to new funds um, proper, for example. Um, um, a very helpful piece of, a uh, very helpful document uh, is, the, is the report by the EU, EU Ombudsman, which came out in April, April this year. And um, I think it's, uh, it's very well uh, applicable um, also to accessibility or even the horizon program, and which matches with some of the ex uh, experiences we have collected at Indian. Uh, for example, the Ombudsman said that the Commission needs to provide better guidance, needs updated and unambiguous guidance for staff 
that the, um, uh, when it comes to DI, the last updated guidance is from 2014, um, that the Commission, when it investigates misuse, has to use other sources of information rather than national authorities, independent sources, because of course national authorities will not provide information which incriminates themselves. Um, persons with disabilities don't play a role in monitoring or oversight. Um, the Ombudsman urged the Commission to facilitate uh, part the representatives of uh, disabled people's organizations. Often such organizations don't have capacity, are too small. Um, this also needs to need support. Um, the Commission needs to follow more closely with uh, the the recommendations the jurisprudence the CFPD uh, CFPD provides member states member states and staff and national administrations don't have enough guidance of the um, and the Ombudsman also criticized that the commission is too um, too careful with also um, yeah, using fines for enforcement um, eventually um, yeah, so I, I think we should not believe that um, we well, we well, need improvements in legislation. Uh, uh, just one, one minute, Florian. The military reviews, so the ethical regulations more what Michael, Yes, sorry, I think uh, the, the Commission initiated the literal review of the, uh, right now, of the MFF, and I think the regulation, we need to have a look that they are more watertight but also work on the implementation and oversight problems. And I think the parliament can also um, play a big role in this. In, I asked the commission last week about plans to implement the Ombudsman report and they could not answer it. I think they might not have any plans. So and this is also where the parliament could play a big role to keep um, um, highlighting the materials that are out there so that administrations cannot rebuild out of this. Thank you, Florian. And now just uh, I will pass it back for one minute to Daniel, and then we will do uh, as planned. So uh, I think quite briefly, most of the important proposals and ideas were already highlighted. So to improve the situation when it comes to accessibility in new funds, what needs to be done has already been said, better guidance for national authorities, that means training and awareness of what accessibility and inclusion is, also better monitored by, by the European Commission on where the money and how it is spent. Uh, in, I'm sure also that in the, in the, the selection procedures there's accessibility experts that can really assess um, what's going on and there's also references to the standards that were already mentioned. Also to see how the complaint mechanisms by citizens work and if they need to be improved. Uh, and two more things, which was also mentioned, the Access EU Center could be an opportunity, so we need to ensure that it, it is properly uh, implemented, it, that it works well, and the final one and the most important one is the involvement of persons with disabilities because at the end of the day are the ones who have the expertise and will know that something is completely inaccessible or not, so those would be the main ideas. Excellent, thank you. Um, now I will pass it on to... Yes, thank you. I have one more thing. Uh, I was thinking what you just said, that we just we are just talking, well this is what we are doing here. I, I've been here three years and I've been just talking. I mean, it's very sad, but um, what else can we do? I, you know, I mean, sometimes it is about talking and I'm very sorry to say that, uh, but I completely agree with you that it's not enough. And I was thinking like, what can we do? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Krimpropoulos, myself, and uh, Madame Lange and Siegmann, we all come from EMPO. Uh, this is the Employment uh, and Social Affairs Committee in this uh, building. So we cover uh, the, 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 the problematic or the area of, of people with disabilities is within, very much within our competence. So, so what we could do, uh, we could get together with the Commission, with uh, our DG for Employment and Social Affairs, and maybe we can talk about making it binding in the call for EU project, because I think it's not enough for you to be present at the evaluation of the, of the project, because when the building is already reconstructed, 
used uh, the, the EU funds, I mean, they will not destroy it and, and change it just because you said it's, it's not good enough, you know, for all people, even for people with disabilities. I mean, this is, you know, this is, you know, that it's naive, right? So you have to be at the very beginning of this, this whole process. So I would say maybe if we make it binding in all the calls on EU projects, right? that uh, regard reconstructions or, or building or a new building. And if we make it binding that, that uh, an association or organization of people with disabilities has to be present from the very beginning, maybe this could be the start.